What is going on, Sleeper Nation? We are here with a post first round draft episode. Super exciting. Lots of players went down. Lots of trades went down. Surprisingly, that's always fun. And I'm here with the number one Australian analyst who somehow is up at what 4 30 in the morning for you it's just coming how you're doing it's just coming up on six o'clock here mate it's the morning after the night before and i've got to be honest i think i prefer these early morning records to the uh the usual 1 a.m that i uh i stay up for i feel feel far more alert than i normally would um i'm actually not Gonna disagree with you. This is a little bit interesting because usually I come right after work and then, you know, I, after work, you take that after work dump and then all of a sudden you're just ready to do an episode. And now it's kind of like, oh, you know, for me, since I live in San Francisco now, it's kind of like almost nighttime. I'm starting to get ready for bed. And for you, you're waking up. I know that's well. Speaking of the after work dump, uh, I have not had my first coffee of the morning. Otherwise, I would probably have to duck out for about fifteen minutes mid record and uh, maybe just gather my thoughts on the uh, the, re- the remaining picks in the draft. So let's fly through this so I can have a coffee and a shower and unfortunately yeah. get to my boring ass day job. Oh, good luck with that. But all right, so first pick: Jacksonville Jaguars, Trevor Lawrence. No surprise there. I think he'll be a pretty good quarterback right now, and th- they seem to have helped him out. Of course, we'll talk about some future picks that they just had later on in the draft. But, I mean, it's straightforward, right? Yeah, absolutely. This was a a foregone conclusion. The only real intrigue over the day was whether he would be throwing to Tyler Eifert or to Tim Tebow as his tight end. Uh, But Urban Meyer got his guy. The Jags got his guy. And I've got to say, I think the only thing standing between uh, Jacksonville and a London franchise is Trevor Lawrence. If he hits, if he becomes that... A golden-haired superstar, I think we can uh, press pause on there being an NFL team in London for probably the next 15 years. Ah, that's actually a pretty good take. But will there be a Thanks, franchise in, in in London? Yeah, see, I, I give you credit. I, uh, I thought there might be a slow progression to maybe uh, eight and nine games uh, each side of the Atlantic and slowly ramp up. Um, but to be honest, I think if, if Lawrence hits, the Jags become a powerhouse. It's not going to happen. But by the same token, if Lawrence hits becomes a bit of a, a face of the NFL and the Jags don't have the success that matches, we might see it move. Uh, we might see them move to London because, uh, they'll need marketable players to, uh, to get to the, the broader audience here. Uh, but that's probably a discussion for another day. Let's move on to pick two and Zach Wilson from the New York Jets. Another foregone conclusion, but what do you reckon, Natter? I like it. I think he has got all the intangibles to make all the throws that a Shanahan offense, yes, this is going to be a Shanahan offense, can design. It's pretty straightforward as Trevor Lawrence. Some people have had Zach Wilson higher on their draft board than Trevor Lawrence. But, I mean, at that point, it's just apples to oranges. It's now who could surround the quarterback with the best supporting cast. Yeah, exactly. And we've seen a lot of teams do that uh, in the draft is get those big name players around their quarterback. The Jets took a, an inside offensive lineman later in the first round, which is good news for Wilson. Keep him up off the ground, but I will reserve judgment. I still think there is an overdrafting and overcompensation of these Mahomes type players. Yes, Wilson can make every throw in the book, but if they're not going to his team, then there's no point being able to throw it uh, below the horizontal. We'll see. We'll see. I I do like where the Jets are going, but the Niners also with another quarterback in Trey Lance. Now, now I wouldn't compare him quite to Patrick Mahomes. Actually, I give him a Josh Allen type comparison, a little bit bigger bodied, lacks a little bit of physical contact, can run, has a little bit of throw power to him. Uh, I mean, uh, he is the golden landing spot for quarterbacks. He's going to sit behind Jimmy Garoppolo for at least a year, maybe even two at that point. But uh, I mean, uh, this is another... I don't want to say reach by the Niners, but they're definitely made sure they secure their guy. He fits perfectly with, uh, with Shanahan. He's got the, that rushing ability on the ground, but also protects the ball. Uh, I think there's a lot to like about Lance. He goes to a pretty good spot where he's got, uh, an advantageous, advantageous play caller. Um, he's going to have weapons around him and he's going to have a chance to sit and, uh, develop his QB skills and not be thrown into the fire straight away. So I think that's a pretty good pick by the Niners and another foregone conclusion I say another Trey Lance probably wasn't Kyle Pitts uh, of Florida to Atlanta he's been comped I suppose to Calvin Johnson I've seen him comped 
to Julio Jones, and the Falcons have another weapon to add to Jones and Ryan and Calvin Ridley. I mean, two wide receiver ones. Now a tight end one. Quarterback looking phenomenal. Mike Davis is looking real juicy now at the running back position. Now that I mean, of course they could still pick up another running back through the draft, but right now Mike Davis is looking like a certified RB one in your specially redraft leagues. Yeah, absolutely. And we were speaking to the Pats this week on the show. And you asked what was the only thing that was going to stop the Falcons. Well, it really is the Falcons' defense. Uh, this offense looks all systems go. And if you're paying that money to to Matt Ryan, you're paying that money to Julio Jones. Whether he stays there or not, um, you may as well try and run up the score as best you can and not have to worry about defense. I'll tell you what, those will be fun games to watch, especially on red zone. Now, the Bengals... Okay, we, we, we've debated this a, con- a couple of times. I said they should go offensive line. You wanted Jamar Chase. Well, you won that battle. Jamar Chase is going to be the guy. I still strongly disagree with this, but it, it'll make for fun football to watch. I could have sworn I wanted uh, Penne Sewell, but here we are. Rewrite history, man. That's fine. Um, That's what but- I do. <laughs> no, I like it. It's it's the first of the, the reunions in the draft. Give Burrow a weapon. We talked about the importance of building around those young quarterbacks and uh, getting Burrow, his number one guy from college, I think is an exceptional move. I'm a big fan of Jamar Chase. I think without Kyle Pitts, he is probably the best offensive talent in this draft. And uh, I'm excited for Bengals fans. Hopefully, he can be the next in that sort of soft generation of Ocho Cinco to AJ Green and now Jamar Chase. Sell some jerseys, get some bums on seats, and again, make them relevant. Uh, you mentioned the Falcons being a fun team to watch on Red Zone. I think the Bengals are going to be too. Hopefully, Joey Burrow will be ready and healthy by week one. I mean, we saw a little, he teased a little bit on Instagram, him throwing a little, a couple of deep passes to, uh, I think it was, uh, T Higgins. I'm not sure who the wide receiver was, but I mean, he's starting to look on the right track, but we got the Miami Dolphins picking up Jalen Waddle, wide receiver for Alabama. So now in dynasty leagues, of course, we're, we're now going to be drafting these players. Who would you rather have out of the two? Oh, I would take Chase all day. Um, Chase all day? Is that is that even, like, debatable? No, not really. Ch- Chase is no. a generational talent. I, lo- I love Waddle. I think he had an exceptional college career. Um, he's back with Tua, with whom he had one of the great college seasons by a receiver. I think this is an excellent move by Miami. I am surprised, I guess, that at, at pick six you take that wide receiver too, but Waddle is excellent. It's, um, it's probably the first fantasy relevant move worth talking about because he's going to live in the slot. Will Fuller's going to live on the outside. That's some excellent speed for Tua to use there. Uh, and I'm just reading in this article here, Waddle averaged 10 yards after the catch. So hopefully the rest of the AFCs can work out how to tackle in the secondary. Otherwise, Waddle is going to run through them like last night's dinner. And right now, the Dolphins are surrounding Tua with as much talent as humanly possible. Right now, there's no excuse for him to not succeed. Am I correct? No, absolutely not. He's got all those weapons there. Uh, they're building a decent offensive line. He's got good coaching around him. Um, and hopefully, with a year in the system, he's a bit more confident in that um, in that offense. They take the training wheels off him a little bit and actually see what they have in the guy. Yeah, I want to see some deep ball throwing. I want to see some over-the-top play action passes. I want to see him let loose a little bit. Speaking of offensive linemen, and now Detroit Lions, they picked up an offensive lineman, Peniel Sewell. Sorry, I don't even know if I said it's his uh, name. It's Sewell. Sen- I was close enough. I mean, is this fantasy relevant? I mean, it's cool and all. We wanted to see a wide receiver, right? I think this is a good move by the Lions. Sewell is one of the better prospects in the draft, which obviously he's been taken at seven. Um, I think you could argue that he is as uh, exciting, probably not as exciting, sorry, but as potentially influential as a Kyle Pitts or Jamar Chase. This is good business for the Lions. They they stuck fat with their, their pick. Um, they're protecting Jared Goff and hopefully uh, giving a Swift someone to run behind, which is which is even better for us fantasy owners. So now they don't have necessarily wide receivers or elite wide receivers that we can talk about to throw to. Is there anyone that sticks out? Uh, I think we could be looking at Terrace Marshall early on day two mm-hmm. or potentially okay. Armin Ra St. Brown. They're the two that I think are probably likely to go within the first 10 picks on the second day there. Or maybe even Elijah Moore, a guy who was touted to potentially go in the first round. 
um, who might slip to them early on in the second. And that would be a nice playmaker to pair with Goff and uh, almost reunite him and Tavon Austin. Huh, close enough. Now, I think some of the two biggest surprises was J.C. Horn, quarter, uh, cornerback, going to Carolina, and then Patrick Sertain the second, going to Denver Broncos. Uh, I mean, they were heavily touted as wanting quarterbacks. And earlier today, both the Niners and the Broncos almost secured Aaron Rodgers. I mean, we, we could spend a lot of time talking about this, but I'm surprised that they both went on the defensive side of the football. It's a a big move for Carolina. I was certain that they would go for Mac Jones. Obviously, it's a level of faith they have in Sam Darnold. I suppose they did give up a little bit to get him, so it makes sense that they might um, stick with him for a year. But I thought having spent the week with Mac Jones at the Senior Bowl, been really impressed, uh, they would have gone there. I don't have a lot on Horn and Sertan. I know they are both very highly touted. These are teams that need help. Um, in the secondary, but it is interesting that I think every pick the Panthers had last year was on defense. They've now added another defensive player. At some point, they've got to give uh, Joe Brady some toys, and that, I suspect, is coming in the rest of the draft. As for the Broncos, they have a pretty stacked offense already. You add Aaron Rodgers to that, and, I mean, look out. But even if it's Bridgewater, even if it's uh, Drew Locke, he's got all those weapons there, and um, you've got to... Stop other teams scoring on you. They have a defensive-minded coach. So, yeah, fill their boots. I'm sure we'll hear a bit of a breakdown in the coming weeks from our IDP expert, Aaron Nyhart. Um, but neither of us are, are really plugged in on that, I don't think. No, 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 no. The only defense I support is going to be the actual defense that you plug in in your redraft leagues for the most part. Yeah, so d- defense is the thing that keeps the crowd from the field? Mm-hmm. Yes, you are 100% correct there. Now, the Philadelphia Eagles traded up, surprisingly. With their divisional rival Dallas to pick up Devonte Smith, and that could be questionable for years to come, depending how Devonte Smith does. But I mean, he's not a big receiver. I'm he. he what what is he weighted? One sixty six. I'm one seventy myself, and I'm uh, six feet tall. And I think he's like six two. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd want you playing receiver for me. No offense. No, nah, no. Nah. This is a, a good bit of business from the Cowboys. It's nice to accrue those picks, um, but it's also a big balls move from Jerry Jones to say that you know what. You can go up and get your wide receiver, the Heisman winner, and we're still going to beat you. We don't care that we're letting you get this guy. We are still going to beat you. Um, Smith, nice piece for for Jalen Hurts. They needed some help. We've been saying um, Ragor didn't really work out the way they wanted him to. But now, Pear Smith with Ragor and uh, maybe my man Travis Fulgham or uh, or Greg the Stop Sign Ward and... um, this, this is the makings of a decent offense. They weren't going to go backwards by adding a, uh, a wide receiver. So this is a nice pick. There we go. Now, th- one, of, w- one of my favorite picks is the Chicago Bears trading up and picking up Justin Fields. I think this is a phenomenal pick. I think it was worth every penny that they traded for it because, I mean, they are basically a quarterback away from being a real playoff contender. They got a good defense. They got, they, they got, they got some wide receivers. They got a couple of running backs. They got, they can use some help on the offensive line, but once once they get that, I think that's it. They're a playoff team. Yeah, I th- I think the Bears are, are well positioned, and they mortgage their future, I suppose, to get uh, Khalil Mack. They're now doing the same to get Justin Fields. We talked about uh, the last pick uh, from the Cow- or the last trade back from the Cowboys being a big balls move. This is a big balls move from Ryan Pace trying to save his job. Um, you can't go out there with Andy Dalton and expect to be a playoff team as good as Dalton has been. This is an exciting move. Fields gets it done on the ground. Field gets, Fields gets it done on the air. He has the potential to be the first Bear, uh, Bears quarterback to pass for 4,000 yards. Um, I think two good seasons he might be the best quarterback to have ever played for the Bears. Uh, so this is this is an exciting pick. Again, makes the Bears watchable. Uh, it's good news for Allen Robinson. It's good news for Darnell Mooney. I would think a running quarterback is probably good news for David Montgomery as well. Now, if you go on the Bears Twitter, it'll show Andy Dalton with a caption of QB1. How long till that post gets taken down? Well, if that's not down already with a, a picture of uh, Soldier Fields here, then, you know, d- just l- enjoy it while you can, Andy. I'm sure Dalton will start the season for them anyway, uh, but Fields will be in there not too long afterwards. Or we might see Dalton on the move again. <sighs> One more time for the fun of it, the Red Rocket is going to have to strike somewhere else. I hope now so. Dallas, now Dallas, they took a defensive player, a little linebacker. We're not going to talk about him too much, you know. That doesn't produce fantasy points. We don't care about that. The Chargers, though, on the other hand, picked up an offensive tackle, one that they need, 
And two, this is my favorite. I love it when teams pick offensive tackles because it doesn't ruin the fantasy impact of the receivers and running back. Like right now, Keenan Allen, this bumps him up. Eckler bumps him up. Herbert bumps him up. Whoever's going to be the tight end there bumps them up also. And, 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 and there's nobody else now to, to, to bottleneck any, any, any fantasy points. Yep, absolutely nailed it, mate. This is good news for everyone on the Chargers roster, especially Justin Herbert. Uh, we saw what he could do when given a clean pocket. We saw what he could do when given a dirty pocket, and hopefully Rashawn Slater stops him from having to run from his life so much and can make those plays down the field a bit more. Yeah, I mean, Keenan Allen's biggest knock was quarterback play and offensive line play. The, 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 his biggest knock was he couldn't get the ball enough, and now he can. So, I'm looking for Keenan Allen in a lot of redraft leagues. He's going to be one of my top priorities on the wide receiver side. Absolutely. That's going to be one of those old man discount uh, picks that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, I think. Yes, sir. Now, the Jets also came up and picked up an offensive lineman. I love that also. You get a quarterback, you protect them, improve everybody else's draft stock. Yep. You're not going to have a go at his uh, his name there, mate? No, uh, okay, hold on. Elijah Vera Tucker. No, oh, that, that wasn't too bad. That was that, that wasn't too bad. Absolutely nailed it. They picked uh, yeah, that, the big ticket, Mackay Becton, last year. Uh, again, mm-hmm. building around that young quarterback, although it's a different young quarterback this time. Give him some protection. Give him a chance to make plays, and don't have him out there seeing ghosts like Sam Darnold did. Yeah, that that name wasn't too hard. Uh, I I don't deserve credit for that one. The New England Patriots, though, they deserve credit. They they, they got their quarterback, and they didn't have to do anything. Yeah, they just sat and waited. I was certain, I've said this on the pod, that if Mac Jones got to eight and the Panthers didn't pick him, we were going to see a Bo Callahan-esque slide. I think this is a bit of that, but the Patriots didn't have to give up any capital. They got not, you know, no one's a like for like for Brady, let's be honest, but as close to a Brady 2.0 as you're going to have. He's a pocket guy, sees the field well. We had the Pats on this week talking about uh, how the, the people at the Senior Bowl Loved his leadership, loved his ability to learn the playbook. You know, the New England playbook, famously difficult to learn. Uh, he's going to get a chance to do that. Sit behind uh, Cam Newton for a little bit. Belichick did come out and say that Cam was still their guy. Personally, I think Mac Jones is going to be the guy and Cam might end up in Washington. Uh, but as a, as a Pats fan, it's not the most exciting move, but I am happy to have Mac Jones. He was who I wanted early in the process. I let myself get excited by fields. Um, so... Poured a bit of cold water on it for me, but I'm not unhappy with him. Yeah, all right. Now, Arizona Cardinals picked up another Swiss Army knife on the defensive side, which I think is a heavy mistake. I mean, this isn't fantasy relevant, but they already have Isaiah Simmons, who is a Swiss Army knife in itself, and he was heavily underwhelming last year, being absolutely destroyed by line ba- uh, by tight ends. And then when he get play- when he put put at his safety, he was getting beat deep. And now they picked up another Swiss Army knife. Uh, I kind of disagree with that. Now you have two Swiss Army knives with no real use of him. He was a guy that I thought might have ended up on New England, had a quarterback not fallen to them. Um, but I, I don't like it for the Cardinals. As you say, they picked up another uh, Swiss Army knife. Sometimes uh, positional versatility is a drawback on some of these players. You don't know where they're best suited and it takes them a while to find their feet. Um, but they're clearly building their defense early on and you've got to give them credit for that. There we go. Now, now this is my one of my favorite picks also, other than the Bears one. Uh, Alex Leatherwood. I mean, his name's kind of cool, but the, the, I love it when they show the fans right after a confusing pick because they're trying to like fake their cheer. Yep. But also you can see the unenthusiasm on their faces. And this is one of them. And then I, I had both the, uh, NFL network stream up and then the ASPN stream up, but, but I had the volume on the ESPN stream at the time. I was kind of switching back and forth to see who I liked a little bit more at the time. And, and on ESPN, they, they were just railing this pick and it made me so happy because I know I have a couple Raider friend, Raiders friends and I just know I get to rub it in their faces a little bit. Yeah, this is a classic uh, big guy in the crowd who looks confused and then starts nodding like, yeah, that wasn't bad. You're like, you don't know, yeah. man. You know, what's, what do you know about line play? We <sighs> vaguely do this uh, more often than the man in the street. Now, I, I got to tell you, I know nothing about line play, but I do know the Raiders, their much vaunted defensive line wasn't what it want, uh, wasn't as productive as, as people thought it might have been, and they needed to build from it. This is a good pick. I guess this is good for Josh Jacobs. I guess this is good for Kenyon Drag. I guess this is good for Derek Carr. Um, and, you know, he might be the fastest lineman 
in the uh, in the class. So, you know, Al Davis still looking down and smiling. There we go. <laughs> That's probably the only silver lining I could think of in this pick. Now, a couple of defensive players got picked up right after that from the Dolphins and the Washington football team. I could never disagree with taking line back, uh, defensive ends. Uh, you can never have enough of them. But the Giants, this is almost as much as a question mark as the Raiders. Take me through it. Well, I assume they just handed off the pick to any Giants fan available and he simply said, Hey, Tony! Um, but I, I hate this pick really like Kadarius Tony's grown on me as the draft process is gone but early on he was a guy that was getting taken around here in mock drafts I was seeing people on Twitter being like Kadarius Tony is my number three overall dynasty receiver like get your head out of your ass mate like Tony has played one good senior season for the Gators he was excellent albeit 70 catches, 984 yards, 10 touchdowns, runs a good route, decent hands, yada, yada, yada. You want him with a good offensive mind. Is that Jason Garrett? Who knows? But conceptually, this is a good move by the Giants. You keep building around that young quarterback. And Daniel Jones now has an embarrassment of weapons. And to be honest, if he can't get it done this year, then they'll need to move on from him. For a fantasy, as a, pers- a fantasy perspective, this is a good pick. I think as an actual team perspective, I think they should have went on the defensive side of the football. Uh, I don't know if you want to disagree with me there. No, I was just going to say we have um, Dave Gettleman trading down for the, the first time in his life. But with Joe Judge, former special teams coach, this feels like a pick for special teams. Uh, that's That's a little rough and a little disheartening especially in the first round so we, we had a, a couple more defensive picks from the colts the titans albeit they really needed those picks i think that was probably a very good pick for them and then we saw another offensive tackle off the board from the minnesota vikings we like to see that justin jefferson's stack sta- stock sorry i should say remains intact Thielen intact dalvin cook intact I, I i just love offensive linemen when they get taken on already established offenses yep Yep, exactly. Another good bit of business from the Vikings. They moved back uh, in a trade with the Jets and uh, replace Riley Reef. Now, two running backs get taken off the board next, which I'm pretty surprised about. I mean, I, I kind of anticipated the Steelers taking Najee Harris, but Travis Etienne was a pretty big surprise for me because, I mean, they already have established running backs. I felt like they had so many more holes to fill other than the running back position. Yeah, absolutely. It, um, well, it's another, uh, another, reunion between um a uh, trevor lawrence and uh an etn there um i don't like it i traded for james robinson quite a lot over the off season so i'm not a fan of this it's also not a it's a it's a loss for the little guys of the league you know uh, robinson came in was hyper productive i know he wasn't necessarily efficient but he got the job done and it's just the disrespect for an udfa that teams uh well bad teams can't look past the draft capital um, you didn't need to spend the 25th overall pick on Travis Etienne here. You could have got someone in the mid rounds if that's what you wanted to pair with Robinson. But Etienne's a good player. I think this sort of tanks his draft stock a little bit. We'll move him behind Javante Williams. Sight unseen where Williams is going to land. Um, but not, it's not a great situation all round, is it? No, I mean, now James Robinson, his draft stock took a huge nosedive. If you were in a redraft league, you're looking at him in the second round. And uh, now maybe he's a fourth, fifth rounder. He, he just lost his third down roll. There's still Carlos Hyde. I mean, the offense isn't still, we, we don't know how efficient that offense is going to be to the, are they going to be scoring touchdowns? Are they be even giving him red zone opportunities? We don't know anymore. It, it, it's a cluster and it's a little sad because it's another highly touted running back that gets taken off of the workhorse load. And now there's only what four or five running backs that could be safe RB ones. Yeah. It, it really means those those first five picks even in super flex now you are looking at getting those three down workhorse backs um we sort of glossed over him but this is another guy who might be Najee harris um we've talked about him a lot over the past couple of weeks so there's no real point in in diving into and this is a good pick for the steelers it's a position of need um i did say that i didn't think they were going to pick him because good franchises don't pick running backs early so bully for me i guess um but yeah, this is this is good news for the Steelers, and as we say, he's one of those guys who might be a three down back in that scheme. We don't. They drafted running backs throughout the the past couple of years, whether it's Betty Snell, McFarland, Connor, and now Najee Harris. I mean, they're definitely not 
shy or trigger shy on pulling the trigger on our, our running back. I'm surprised that they're doing it. I think they should have upgraded the offensive line to make sure whichever running back is running could actually have an opportunity to be productive. They just added another running back behind a weak running offensive line. I, I, I disagree with the pick, but I mean, I don't, I don't blame them for doing it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I totally agree with you. Disagree. All righty. Greg knows some, another cornerback for the Cleveland Browns. They're stockpiling the defensive side. I really like it. They already have a solid offense. They should be able to function well on the offensive side. And right now they're gunning for the Chiefs. And I think this is the right way. They were so close to beating the Chiefs. Another lockdown corner could be exactly what the doctor ordered. Yep. And Newsom has those wheels to, as you say, not that you, you eye up your competition, but certainly the teams that are pushing for the Super Bowl would. This is a guy who can lock down potentially Tyree Kill. Rashad Bateman, Baltimore Ravens wide receiver. I mean, I don't know how I feel about a Ravens wide receiver. I'll let you break it down. I still love Bateman. I still think he's one of, well, he's still my, my wide receiver too. Talent wise, I think now Waddle has slipped ahead of him in my draft order, but this is going to push him towards the back of the first round, maybe into the early second. And I think that's a place where you can capitalize and get that value because ostensibly people look at Baltimore, people look at receivers and don't want to borrow of it. But Bateman is a guy who is going to be productive out of the slot. That's where Lamar Jackson does his best work within the numbers. Uh, Bateman is quick. He's shifty, can change direction. So if Jackson takes off, hopefully they can get on the same page, maybe form a bit of a Doug Baldwin, Russell Wilson style connection there. I think this is going to be an excellent pick. Um, I think this is going to be a sneaky fantasy productive pick. And, you know, for those of you who hold it, held on to Miles Boykin or uh, Hollywood Brown, it's probably going to give them a little bit of a bump. So not huge for Boykin. I wouldn't be going out and drafting him. The only issue is the touchdowns. You're going to have Mandrews in the red zone uh, as their main guy there. Obviously, Lamar is going to get his share too and those running backs. So he'll probably be a thousand yard receiver, but I would think maybe four or five touchdowns could be his ceiling. I have a difficult time drafting a receiver on a team that runs over 60% of the time, especially if I anticipate them winning most games, then they're not going to be passing as much. I personally, in my dynasty rookie drafts, I'm going to let somebody else take Rashad Bateman, and I think I'm going to let them fall to the will he boom or bust trap, and uh, I'll probably stick with somebody else if that if that happens to fall to me. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, Peyton Turner, defensive end for the Saints, don't blame him for that. Another, oh, this is, this is, I, I love this right here. Green Bay Packers taking a cornerback. I love this. I mean, you have, you have Aaron Rodgers threatening to leave, saying he doesn't want to be on the team. He, the Packers are already a meme because they refuse to give Aaron Rodgers help. And when they do, it's in the form of a running back. They still don't have solid wide receiver help other than Devontae Adams. And they decided to go for a cornerback. I, th- th- this makes me so happy. I just think this is phenomenal. I love their, Packers organization and how much they are willing to screw over Aaron Rodgers. I know it's a big, big middle finger to Jeopardy's own Aaron Rodgers. Well, I think Stokes is not quite as bad of a pick as some of these other defensive players they've gone for, given I think he might contribute on special teams a bit too. So that's getting a little bit closer to offensive players. But uh, after seeing Kevin King burned by Scotty Miller in the NFC Championship game, uh, it's no surprise they... They try to get a, a cornerback here to upgrade from him. This is a, it's realistically a phenomenal pick. I mean, now they have Jair Alexander, who is a lockdown corner and one of probably a top five corner. And then they have an opportunity to have another lockdown corner on the opposite side. I mean, that's, it's great NFL wise, but it's just, it's funny fantasy wise. And it's funny if you're a Aaron Rodgers watcher who wants to see him traded. I, I think it's, it's just, Kind of ironic in that way how it's all panning out. I wonder if Aaron Rodgers' family are secretly part of the Packers war room and just want to screw him over. I saw a thread, a little comment section where they thought Aaron Rodgers would get drafted by the Niners and then he would retire right as soon as he became a Niner as one of those, I told you you wish you would draft me type of <laughs> little insult to injuries type things. That's I excellent. thought that would have been great. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> but the Buffalo Bills took a much needed defensive end. I mean, whoever played against the Bills had all day in the in the pocket. It's definitely something they needed. And then a handful of more defensive players taken on the end of the draft from the Ravens to the Buccaneers. Yeah, I uh, I really like this pick by the Bills. You said um on said before that you hoped 
Uh, the Bills would go defensive line. They needed that pass rush. And Gregory Rousseau is uh, is an excellent player. He was one of those guys who had a broad range of outcomes compared to some of the others in the class. Uh, but I think this is an excellent pick, pairing with Sean McDermott, uh, and the Bills have some some good pass rush there. I don't really have much about Jason Owe or Joe Tryon, but probably good news for, for these guys who might do very little and end up with a ring at the end of the year. That's, uh, you know, that's all you could ever ask for. I mean, it was, we, we don't care about the defensive side of the football. Does, that does not bring us fantasy points. So give me a quick winner and a loser, and then we'll call it a night and I'll let you grab your coffee. I am, ooh, who is, who's a, who's a winner here? You know what? I'm going to say Bears fans are a big winner out of this. You know, you could have had a year of treading water, could have had a year watching Andy Dalton, another year with Alan Robinson on the way out. You've spent all these picks and you're getting nothing from it. So Bears fans, the big winner, Justin Fields, I think that's excellent. The big winner fantasy wise, I think is going to be Tua with Jalen Waddle. Um, and he would be maybe getting closer to a, a QB one this year. And the loser, I think, is Kadarius Tony. Um, obviously, bagged him a little bit earlier. I think he has ability. He needs to go to the right situation. I don't think this is it for him. Um, but we will we will see. How about you? Who are your winners and losers here? Uh, I'm giving the Chargers the winner's tag. Everybody gets better, and there's a lot to look forward in the city of Los Angeles. If it's not the Rams, I should say. I think the biggest loser is just going to be Aaron Rodgers from the sole fact that they just refuse to help him. And it's just fun to watch at this point. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, here we go. Here's the loser, James Robinson. James Robinson's a big loser. Uh, being a Raiders fan, that's definitely a big loser. You know, uh, it, <laughs> I was definitely talking to a Raiders fan and we, we, we kind of, I brought up the fact that they have not hit on any draft picks other than Josh Jacobs. And it's not that hard to have your running back hit as a pick. And Josh Jacobs hasn't even been that phenomenal and game changing of a running back. He's been above average at best. No. And of course, of course, Mike Mayock has been touted to be a phenomenal drafter. And then so has, uh, Jay Gruden or John Gruden. Yeah. I think, um, it's been very disappointing this, this Gruden Mayock regime. Um, but. You know, we can, we can point and laugh, and isn't that what all of it's about in the end? It really is. You're so not wrong, especially as a, a Raiders franchise. I feel like that's half the point of them. But all right, so I'm going to let you get your coffee. Yep. We are going to be back with a couple of special guests, and we're going to break down most of the draft. And then, of course, we're going to do another deep dive on the winners and losers. That's always fun. I love talking about winners, considering I'm always going to be one of them. And I know you like talking about losers. Yeah, uh, for the same reasons. <laughs> True, true. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But all right, guys. Good luck, everybody. Take it easy, guys. Bye.